Okay, so hey, she can get started a little bit early because uh, Daniel's very open to questions. Um, so I think the longer the discussion we have, all the better. So I'm Ms. Bellman Tanius, I'm the uh, faculty member in Earth and Planetary Sciences, and I'm also the director of the UC Davis uh, Institute of the Environment. And it's a real pleasure today to have Daniel Swain. Uh, he is a research scientist at the Institute of the Environment and Sustainability at UCLA. He also wears two other hats. He's a research fellow in the Capacity Center for Climate and Weather Extremes at what we call NCAR, or the National Center for Atmospheric Research, and the California Climate Fellow for the uh, Nature Conservancy of California. And in his free time, he's the author of the Weather West blog, which you may know him for as well as his other work, because uh, certainly the media uh, has used it regularly. So Daniel's research is, yeah, is in advancing our understanding of how climate change uh, has already and will continue to impact uh, our regional weather uh, in the West. And of course, beyond that. But he's, uh, he's been recognized for many times for this work, including being named a Switzer Environmental Fellow by the Robert and Patricia Switzer Foundation, and named a prestigious National Academy of Sciences Cobbley Fellow. And if that's not enough, in 2020, he was named I love this. Human of the Year by Mike's Magazine. And I did have a chance to see, look up Mike's Magazine. That could be a good thing or a bad thing. <laughs> but, you know, maybe just as importantly, Daniel's one of our own. He actually graduated with a BS in Atmosphere Sciences from Davis uh, with the highest of honor. And uh, yeah, he got a PhD in Earth System Science from that other university in Stanford. <laughs> so beyond being an exceptional climate scientist, uh, Daniel has a special aptitude for communication to a broader uh, audience. And the media has really grabbed on to descriptions of, that he has coined, like the ridiculously resilient bridge that I just chatted with him about. Um, I, I was going to say that it has affected our weather, warmer, drier. It's not that simple. But they love that term. Uh, his projection of the mega storm. Uh, in our future, and of course, weather whiplash. Uh, at just at a sustainable conservation board meeting last week, uh, we invited a special guest from the Water Foundation, and she was supposed to regale us with unknown yet funding opportunities that were coming. And she sat down at the beginning of her talk with, um, I'm going to say I, I know only two things. One, there's a heck of a lot of funding coming, and two, at the foundation, we have to start everything with weather with life. So thanks to them. So with no further ado, uh, I'm very pleased to have Daniel here today and have you uh, join us. seminar uh, before we knew what this winter was going to look like. Uh, I seem to have arrived during a, a, an unusually nice window of weather compared to how things have been uh, the last few months. So I'm, I'm grateful that it's good, good walking around weather. But I think it also sets the stage for, for what I wanted to talk about today anyway. And as Isabel mentioned, uh, this is really a pretty short and informal talk with the idea that we'll have a nice uh, long time for conversation, uh, Q&A, and discussion afterward. Uh, so, without further ado, uh, a brief primer, if you will, um, on the climate that we already have in California. Now, anybody who's spent more than about a year here uh, is well aware of our uh, 
sort of unique position relative to almost anywhere else in the continental U.S., and arguably relative to most places in the world, except for a relatively small handful of places that have similar climates, often called so-called Mediterranean climates, uh, so named for the climate of the eastern Mediterranean and, and similar subtropical regions around the world, uh, which exists primarily on the west coast of continents, uh, in the subtropics uh, near the border with the sort of mid-latitude climate regime to the north. So there's not too many places on Earth uh, that inhabit that niche. And what this means is that we sort of exist at a climatological transition zone between the much more stable subtropics to the south uh, and the much more active mid-latitude uh, weather patterns to the north. In fact, California kind of bisects that transition zone. Uh, but the transition zone is not a static feature in space or time. It shifts seasonally, it uh, shifts from year to year, and this explains why we have such a strongly cyclical precipitation climatology in California. So we have just yeah, famously wet winters and dry summers, and that is actually unusual for places uh, at California's latitude in the world, except for these other regions that have so-called Mediterranean climates. It also shifts uh, from year to year. So you might hear that we, there's a tilt in the islands towards wetter winters in El Nino years and drier winters uh, in La Nina winters. That did not work out very well this year, but it still remains true in the long run. Uh, that's primarily because it shifts the latitudinal position of this transition zone from year to year uh, due to changes in the geographically remote tropical Pacific Ocean thousands of miles away is influencing the latitude of this transition zone in the state. So, what all of this means is that California has a climate and has had a climate for thousands of years that is subject to very high variability, uh, both year to year, season to season, and even within seasons. And it makes it uniquely vulnerable in some ways to drought and also floods on the other end of the spectrum because we really only have one season per year in which to accumulate whatever water is going to fall from the sky. It's, it's winter. And if something comes along during winter, say a persistent ridge of high pressure that reflects the storm track uh, and has a, an alliterative nickname, uh, that essentially uh, means we're out of luck. That whole year, we have to wait at least until the next winter, and if we're not lucky, until the winter after that, because that's, those are really our only real windows of opportunity to accumulate water. Because we have such an intensive rainy season, you know, California has a pretty diverse uh, set of ecologies, and some of them require a lot of water. In order for that to work out on average, it means that the winters, therefore, in those places, have to be really wet in a concentrated period. So that's where California's susceptibility to flood comes in. It makes this region really vulnerable to both drought uh, when it's not raining and then getting too much water all at once on the opposite end of the spectrum. I'm going to cut right to the chase here uh, because I think this is what folks in the room are really interested in. Uh, is California's future uh, drier or wetter? And I would argue that the answer is both uh, at different times in such a way uh, that looking at the average, the long-term average, might be very misleading because it is, of course, mathematically possible to add, add more very large positive numbers, but also more negative numbers and come out to roughly the same average as you have before. This is what climate models certainly suggest for California's future, and I think recent observations increasingly suggest that we are uh, well on the way there, that we're starting to live this reality. So as recently as a decade ago, this was a prediction about the future that wasn't really uh, discernible yet in the real world. And I think with the data that we're seeing in just the last five to 10 years, that's starting to change, and some of this is starting to come out of the woodwork. Uh, this is where, by the way, the term uh, precipitation whiplash or hydroclimate whiplash comes from. This notion uh, that it's not so much that the mean state is changing in, a, in an especially obvious way, but even absent large or detectable changes in average precipitation, that we're likely to see quite substantial shifts in the character of precipitation, even if the overall amount may or may not change very much. Another way to think about this, in addition to this year-to-year -year whiplash, which I think is, is the most obvious form, uh, is seasonal whiplash. You could argue that California just has a certain amount of baked-in intrinsic seasonal whiplash. We go from really wet winters to really dry summers, and that's normal. That's typical. It would be weird. It would feel weird if that didn't happen. Uh, and it has felt weird in those random years where this pattern doesn't hold. 
we actually expect that in addition to this increase in year-to-year -year variability, that the seasonal uh, sharpness may increase as well, with potential for weak drying trends in autumn, which is already in transition season, but stronger drying trends in spring, which is definitely another transition season, but potentially wetter conditions in winter. So even if you just look at the typical annual cycle, there are pretty significant changes that sharpen the annual cycle as well. So we see more wood flash between years, but also more wood flash between seasons, even within a typical year. Uh, and this has some significant implications, uh, from, especially from societal and ecological perspectives, because it means longer dry season, uh, shorter rainy season, more intense rainy season. So it means that the wildfire season lengthens and potentially intensifies at the end in autumn because you have an even longer drier period. It means that your flood risk probably decreases in winter because that was the time period that was already wet and now it's getting wetter. And it means that the risk of drought may shift partly because of this also, because if we have drier springs, that attenuates the period where we would stave off the, the warm and dry season to come. So that begins earlier in the year, we have a longer window for warming and drying, given that it's not going to rain very much in the summer. And it's going to be warmer, of course, as well. Uh, this, is a, this is a slide I've actually been using for a few years, but I actually uh, could have updated it because there's now a fourth panel. Uh, with Lake Oroville uh, becoming very full again. Hopefully we don't replicate the second panel. Uh, but just to recap what's happened in this decade, we had an extreme, by any measure, uh, record-breaking, even in a paleoclimate context, drought uh, that peaked around 2014-2015. Uh, then we had a record wet winter in the 2016-2017 year in much of Northern California. That's uh, the year where we had the uh, euphemistically engineering uh, challenge on the uh, Oracle Dam Spillway uh, that was nearly a, a, a little bit more than an engineering challenge. Uh, fell right back into a drought of comparable magnitude, which would have been, again, record-breaking in a millennial paleoclimate context but for the one that happened a few years earlier, uh, in that, that sort of ended in, in 2022. Uh, and now, of course, this year, we're back into very wet conditions where a good portion of the central part of the state just experienced its wettest winter on record again. Again, this is a, this is a less than 10 year period over the time uh, where there's been a lot of emerging research on uh, hydroclimate whiplash in California. So when I say that the evidence observationally has uh, considerably increased in recent years. This is what I mean by that. And there are formal studies that are, that are sort of in the works right now to really formally demonstrate this, but this is a case of a, a growingly, uh, an increasingly compelling anecdote uh, sort of emerging from the real world data. So what's causing this fundamentally? Well, uh, there's a lot going on atmospheric dynamically and thermodynamically, but it turns out that you can explain most of this in a pretty straightforward way. And, the, the, the mechanism that I'm, I'm, I guess the, the new term that I'm coining is the, the, the increasing atmospheric sponge uh, is responsible for a good portion of the projected and the observed increases in hydroclimate whiplash. And this is true beyond California, by the way. The mechanisms are different, and which part of the sponge is getting spongier varies somewhat from region to region. Someone has recently published a paper on the flavors of hydroclimate whiplash, and I like that notion. I think mean, that really is consistent with the argument that it really is basic thermodynamics that's driving a lot of this. And for those who have a background in chemistry or atmospheric science, know that the, uh, I guess you could call it the water vapor holding capacity of the atmosphere, uh, holding the groans from some of the chemists in the room, uh, it's a good way of thinking about what's happening here. And it's an exponential process whereby the amount of water vapor that, that, that can be in atmos the atmosphere at saturation increases exponentially with warming. So this is at a rate of about 4% per degree Fahrenheit or 7% per degree centigrade. And of course, the planet has already warmed more than one degree centigrade. California has warmed considerably more than that. And so we're already getting into territory where this effect is significant. And again, it's, you know, it would be great to get 7% compound interest uh, in, in your savings account. That's a pretty big number. And it makes you realize what this exponential growth can look like in terms of the, the essentially the, the, the atmospheric sponginess. Uh, and 
usually in climate science, we think about this on the wet side of the spectrum. So how, how can this how can this raise the ceiling on how intense precipitation can become as your atmosphere can hold uh, progressively more and more water vapor in an exponential downstream? This also is true. This is something that's emerged from a lot of the biometeorologists uh, in the room and wildfire scientists is the real importance, uh, especially from the biosphere perspective, of this increased atmospheric sponginess on atmosphere uh, evaporative demand. So essentially, you're increasing the, poten the potential evaporation as well as, as the potential precipitation in this. And you're not always realizing these maximum potentials, but under the right conditions, the ceiling on both ends of the spectrum is rising. And so really what this means is that you're accelerating the hydrologic cycle on from both ends, uh, on both the wet side and the dry side. And again, this is not fully symmetric. This isn't necessarily true to the same extent everywhere, but I think in a general sense, it's a good way of understanding certainly what we're seeing in California and also what we're seeing increasingly with various flavors in different regions all around the world. So when it comes to drought, um, and just looking on the left here, I'm deliberately making the actual squiggles fuzzy because that's not what I really want folks to focus on. Uh, but this is a time, these are time series plots for the southwestern United States. This is actually from the broader, uh, lower Colorado Basin, which we've heard so much about because of the extreme water crisis that has developed there in recent years after decades of, of increasingly severe drought. Take a look at the top plot, though. This is about a 100-year time series showing the precipitation in the basin. It really hasn't changed very much. It's not significantly decreased. But if you look at the temperatures, those have very clearly increased strongly, especially in recent years. In fact, there may have been a bit of an acceleration in that, that regional temperature increase. And a little bit harder to see at the bottom is the fact that, and more negative numbers with this index at the bottom, mean drier, droughtier conditions we're seeing longer and more intense drought conditions in the same basin. So just from this alone, understanding what's going on is relatively straightforward. It isn't that there's been a sustained decrease in precipitation, it's that there's been a sustained increase in the temperature. And so it's this increasing evaporative demand that is the main climate change driven component of the quote unquote mega drought, uh, as termed by paleo climate scientists, uh, in, the, in, the, in the Colorado Basin. And so, one implication of this is that precipitation only drought metrics are becoming pretty misleading. Um, if you just looked at precipitation, you probably wouldn't have guessed that the Southwest was in a negative drought right now. Uh, and it's also true that the same amount of, of rain and snow just doesn't go as far as it used to. And this isn't a, this isn't a statement about human consumptive water demand, uh, or actually more efficient per, per, per capita usage than it used to be. This is a physical science statement about how much water can potentially be evaporated back into the atmosphere at a particular period of time. And so it's also true that the temporal concentration of precipitation, the shorter term aspect of the precipitation of flash that I mentioned, also matters because if you have more precipitation but on fewer days, so essentially more intense rain and snowfall, you have more days in between where it's not precipitating, where you have the potential to have significant evaporation. So, uh, Hydrologically speaking, heavy rain doesn't soak through the ground as well, but also the fewer rain days you have, the more net evaporation days you have. Uh, and of course, another thing that's going on is, is just getting warmer, and overall, snowpacks in the American West and many other places are decreasing. Uh, again, this year is an interesting exception to that, with some exceptionally high snowpacks in some places, but overall, even including this year as a data point, uh, this trend remains. And part of this, another way of thinking about this, is that droughts used to be either hot or cold. You could get unusually warm temperatures during a drought, and you could also get unusually cold temperatures during a drought. But now, essentially, relative to the 20th century, all droughts are hot droughts. Uh, and that's increasingly true throughout the world. The, the, the flavor of droughts is changing, and we're getting uh, hot droughts all over the world, do you think? And I've sort of already talked about this, so I'll skim through it a little bit. But this is just work from others suggesting that, again, it really is this temperature and increasing evaporative demand that is the key critical component here. It's the dominant reason why we're experiencing the extreme droughts that we are right now. Uh, let's go in California after this winter, but the broader severe drought in the southwest remains. 
it's, it's the temperature and evaporative demand much more so than a sustained increase in precipitation. And so therefore, that component is attributable to climate change. But I wanted to focus a little more on the other side of the spectrum, uh, especially in the context of our wet winter uh, that, that, that we just experienced, uh, not just in California, but actually throughout a lot of the West. Uh, and this is something I think that's gotten a lot less attention because we've had more very wet years uh, sorry, we've had more very dry years than very wet years recently, although we have had a mix of both. And believe it or not, there's actually more evidence from a precipitation perspective that we're going to see larger upside changes in the wettest years than we will see downside changes in the driest years in a warming climate. And one of the reasons for this is that the primary extreme precipitation generating mechanism in California, uh, which you've probably heard of uh, since it's been the focus of many newspaper headlines over the past few months, are atmospheric rivers. Uh, these are these filamentary corridors of highly concentrated water vapor transport. Really what it means is it's not just a static blob of water vapor, but it's a, it's a, it's a river-like corridor of movement. So the movement component is also important. Uh, you have to have strong winds moving, flexing this water vapor in the sky over your head. And they really, truly are comparable to rivers. A, 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 a medium strength uh, atmospheric river in, in California might contain about 10 times the, the, the water content of the Mississippi River. So this, these are not small features. And that's, of course, all in the form of vapor in the air above your head before it then condenses and falls out as rain or snow, depending on your elevation. Well, how does climate change play into this? Well, without getting into the details of how atmospheric circulation might or might not change, and how El Nino might or might not change, that's probably a, a talk for another day. The most basic thing that's happening is that the water vapor holding capacity of the atmosphere rises by about 7% per degree centigrade or 4% per degree Fahrenheit of warming. You might expect, that unless something strange is happening, the atmospheric rivers would probably intensify at about that rate. And keep in mind that we've already warmed more than one degree centigrade globally, and even more than that locally in the Pacific Basin. What this means is that atmospheric rivers are going to get significantly more intense in a warming climate and produce significantly more extreme precipitation. And this has been the subject of a lot of work that we've done in the last few years to really hone in on this, because uh, partly because in California there's been a huge public policy focus on water scarcity, drought, and wildfire. For understandable reasons, you've seen really terrible recent instances of all of these. But I think we've neglected the flood side of it, and that's really uh, very much at California's peril. So we've really been try trying to get a, a handle on what this might look like. Historically, those of you who know either California history or are familiar with the paleoclimatic record have probably heard of California's great flood of 1861-1862. Uh, it, it was the flood where Leland Stanford realized that the water in Sacramento was rising so quickly uh, that he had to go to his inauguration in a rowboat and ended up re-entering his home after the ceremony was cut short, short via the second story window. Uh, the state capitol was also temporarily relocated to San Francisco, and the representatives traveled there by steamship directly. It was a much shorter trip than it usually is, because you can largely go in a straight line. You just need to get around the East Bay Hills. Um, these kind of floods of this magnitude occur probably uh, at most every 200 years, and probably more frequently than that, maybe every century or so. Uh, there's, there's evidence of five to seven of these in the past millennium in the paleoclimate record. And so these are rare in the context of an individual human lifespan, but they're not rare at all in a geological or system context. So this is something that California has to deal with. Uh, long before California was California, of course. Uh, but we haven't really seen an event like this since 1862. It's been a long time. Well, this was fodder uh, for a fair bit of, of introspection and reflection by a lot of the water and flood folks that I work with on a daily basis, because a modern day repeat would pretty clearly be a catastrophe for California on a very different order than we're used to earthquakes or wildfires uh, in, in sort of the last century. So initial work we did about three or four years ago suggested that there was greater than a 50% chance that we would see an 1862 level flood event cumulatively at some point in the next four years. So the average annual likelihood, perhaps, is still fairly low, but if you multiply that likelihood by 40 years, and in each year it incrementally increases with climate change, uh, then that's a pretty big number altogether. 
So this was motivation for some more recent work that we've done, uh, which is actually updating a decade-old exercise in California that was uh, created by the same folks who, who, who did the Great California Shakeouts. So this was a USGS project for, for earthquakes originally and preparing California cities, Los Angeles and San Francisco, for the quote-unquote big one. Well, our storm 1.0 was aimed at preparing California for the quote other big one, which is a mega flood, essentially, on the order of 1862 or larger, because of course we know that they can occur, even absent climate change, because they have occurred repeatedly in the past millennium. So we designed uh, new, uh, hopefully improved, certainly revamped scenarios for uh, the Armstrong 2.0 project, which remains ongoing. We published some initial results from this last summer. These made a fairly big splash uh, in the news. You may have heard about the, the increasing risk of a California mega flood. But really what this is, and I'm playing an animation depicting what this actual scenario looks like, which we drew from a climate model, model large ensemble, and then downscaled it in high resolution weather models. So we're not making assumptions about the particular concatenations of storms that can occur. We actually said, let's choose the third, second or third biggest one that actually occurs in this very large ensemble of climate models, where these, these climate models are, are run over and over again, replicating the same period, generating a much larger sample size for extreme events than we could possibly get from our really only century long observed record. So the 20th century, in other words, uh, doesn't give us uh, a wide enough sample size to draw upon for two reasons. One, it's only 100 years, and we're talking about events that occur repeatedly on a millennial time scale. But also, the 20th century was the 20th century, and we're living in the 21st century in a warmer climate. So what we wanted to do was update this scenario in a scientifically defensible way, and also include climate change, because the effect of climate change was not uh, considered in the original hard storm scenario, which is today a pretty conspicuous absence, given what we know now. So these are four week long scenarios, so a month, and I just wanted to illustrate uh, qualitatively what this looks like. Uh, what we're talking about is a three or four week period, or anywhere from about 50 to 100 inches of rain, or the snow equivalent of 100 inches of liquid rainfall, could occur in California's mountains. These are very large numbers, and you may ask, how does this compare to the peak of what we saw this winter? And we've actually created two different Park Storm 2.0 scenarios. One uh, that, that is sort of an event drawn from the distribution of events that are, are reasonably likely to occur in a slightly cooler climate of about 10 or 15 years ago, and then in a much warmer climate of about 30 to 50 years from now. Well, the peak of the event this year, in really in December and January, was the wettest four-week period. So that was the best for the apples to apples comparison. Uh, we got about 80% of the way there to the weaker of the two scenarios, but only about halfway to the more extreme one. And we also got lucky because this winter, we came into it all in the midst of a severe drought. Reservoir levels were very low. Soils were dry, rivers were actually quite low. So there was, we got a bonus margin, if you will, where a lot of the initial water did constructive things in saturating soil column and getting big rivers up to base flow and adding some water to the reservoirs. Um, what if it had been a really wet year before this year? What if it had been 20, uh, 20% to 100% larger? Uh, that's the kind of magnitude that we're talking about in these scenarios. So in a warming climate, of course, it's not just a question of the quant total quantity of precipitation, it's also a question of the phase, T-H-A-S-E, of the precipitation, meaning whether it falls as rain rather than snow. And of course, this is mainly a question of the mountains because it doesn't snow very much at lower elevations. California, although again, your mileage may vary this winter at least, depending on whether you're above about 1,000 feet in elevation or not, uh, you might have a very different experience this winter. Uh, but in general, of course, we expect, expect snowpack to decline. And this is reflected in the, the future arc storm scenario as a dramatic shift towards rain at the low to medium elevations in the mountains. Not so much at very high elevations. In fact, at the very highest elevations, we're talking about the, the rarefied air of 10,000 plus feet. We actually see a significantly more snowfall in future extreme storm scenarios. So, uh, if, if anybody who's got a cabin at 10,000 feet, um, beware. But otherwise, the main message here is that there's this quite dramatic shift from snow to rain at most of California's uh, land volume. I mean, most air, there aren't very many places 
in terms of the total uh, accumulated area with elevations above 10,000 feet. So mainly the story here would be more intense. Uh, this is something that my uh, colleague Shining Huang also uh, used to do this on termed the double whammy effect. Uh, so we have this, this challenge where in warming climate, the, the most extreme runoff scenarios are almost a novel, unprecedented regime in some places. Uh, and I'm just uh, I'm not expecting that folks look at all the numbers here, but actually, if you can just look at the fact that there's two different uh, shaded colors here, there's a dark blue and a light blue on each of these plots, look how different they are. And in particular, on the rightmost plot, there is no dark blue. That's because the future runoff in, in the San Joaquin watershed literally doesn't overlap anymore with the runoff from the historical arc storm event. And again, these are both extreme storm scenarios, but the runoff is so much higher in the San Joaquin watershed in particular because of the combination of increases in the precipitation intensity, but it's primarily because of the increases in the fraction of that precipitation falling as liquid rain and running off immediately, rather than snow and accumulating later. This is going to be a problem. Uh, on these watersheds. In fact, this is the very same part of the state that we're so concerned about extreme uh, snow melt flood risk in the coming weeks. It was ironically a record snowpack this year, but the total volume of water is, is the kind of thing that we're talking about. And unfortunately, we may see some of these things play out in the next few weeks in the Antarctic Basin and other places. So what's the, you know, what's the total climate change contribution here? And of course, this is about the end of the story. You know, one paper rarely is in any field. But I think that what's clear at this point, and I put 2022 here uh, interpolated with the rough amount of warming we've seen so far, just to give a sense of where we are on this curve, is sort of we're just beginning on this upward slope. But what we did find is that lurking there in the background, the climate change has probably already doubled over the past century or so. Likely extremely severe flooding in California. So that's not a future prediction, that's a best estimate of what has already transpired. The challenge is we haven't experienced that event yet. So how can you possibly say how much the risk has changed? Well, that's the beauty of large ensembles, is you can create synthetic samples uh, that you can't really observe in the real world. Because you can't reobserve the last hundred years ten times over or fifty times over. That's just, uh, unless somebody has invented time travel. Uh, and alternate universes, that's just not how it works. Uh, but the point here is that there's a pretty significant response for each incremental amount of warming. And we're still on a path globally toward probably at least two degrees and more likely between two and three degrees of global warming. That's going to mean a pretty large additional increment of risk increase, perhaps another doubling in the next few decades of the likelihood of an extremely severe flood event of a particular magnitude. Now think about what that means if you're an engineer or you're a planner. Uh, if you've already doubled the risk of a rare event, say for an event that occurred maybe once per century previously, well, now that's occurring about once every 50 years. Uh, that's still pretty unusual, but that does push it from being something that most of us might never experience, unless we're lucky to live a century, to something that most of us probably will experience. Uh, but then you can imagine that the risk doubles again. Now something that happened uh, probably once a century might happen every 25 years. And what that means is, of course, most of us have experienced more than one of these events in our lifetime, uh, which is a dramatic shift from most people never experiencing an event of this magnitude at all in their lifetime. And so from a planning perspective, uh, this is a pretty big deal. And again, we're not talking about extreme warming scenarios. We're talking about things that are pretty close to the median of where we think we might end up right now. Food for thought. Uh, what does this mean for cumulative risk? This is, the, this is the number that I gave to some flood managers who uh, were not thrilled with this number yesterday. Um, it was a you know, long conversation uh, on, on Tuesday morning. Uh, the cumulative risk of, uh, of an extremely severe flood event in California really over the next four years, um, I guess we're going a little bit past in the past, but roughly over the four year period we getting downish, it's about two and three. So the definition is slightly different than when we got these original numbers from a few years ago regarding the 1862 level event. It's, it's not quite apples to oranges, maybe uh, uh, oranges to tangerines in terms of analogies, but it's a pretty close number. These are high odds. Um, and I think this is something we're really going to have to grapple with in a state where we've really been focused on managing and mitigating wildfire 
and drought risks, um, this one is large. So what are we going to do about it? What can we do about it? Um, I think what we're realizing is that we can't focus too much on these mean state changes. Uh, we can't focus too much on changes in mean precipitation because really that maybe isn't what the problem is. Uh, and if we focus on that, we're actually going to obscure the things that really matter. So the physical reality is that we're likely to see, and I think we're already in the midst of seeing, an increase in both the intensity of the precipitation that does fall, but also in overall aridity. So in other words, probably worse floods and worse droughts along with our loss of snowpack and the more intense runoff that comes along with this. So then instead of trying to manage the risks of flood and drought separately, as we've done historically, maybe we should really be thinking about co-managing these risks because if we know they're both going to increase, uh, can we uh, pit one against the other? Can we leverage flood against drought and vice versa? In some ways, I think we can. Uh, but it is becoming really clear that the way we've done this historically is no longer working. And this is, this is a, a, real, a realization that comes through just talking with water managers and people who work in wildfire and people who manage flood, flood control infrastructure. I think this realization is bombing a lot of folks really quickly. It's just something we can actually experience in recent years. So, how do we adapt to this? Um, Part of it, and this is what the flood manager just did really happy to hear, that we do need to insert that, that a lot of quote unquote hard infrastructure that we have, so the levees, the dams, the dam auxiliary structures, um, cop, cop, or the world, uh, and even things like storm drains and pumps and vertical areas, we're going to perform as expected. So this is not necessarily a question about building new structures, it's more just saying, okay, are we really confident that what we have in place is going to offer as much protection as we currently think it's going to? And what can we do to make sure that they perform up to the level they're supposed to? Uh, but the other thing I think that's critically important is expanding, uh, some folks call it soft infrastructure, but I prefer nature-based infrastructure, natural solutions. Things like levee setbacks and floodplain restoration, uh, river bypasses, you know, when I flew in this week, we did a nice circle on that windy day over the Yolo Bypass, which is performing exactly as it's supposed to this year. It's full of water and it's protecting Sacramento. Um, we need to do more of that and at larger scales. Uh, and that is easier said than done. These are complicated projects, both because they, of course, require a lot of money, but also in California, the bigger problem is they require a lot of buy-in from landowners, uh, from policymakers, and there's a lot of politics involved in California water and in California agriculture and of course in California land use, all of the things that would be needed. But I think the cost of not approaching these things with seriousness uh, is arguably a lot greater. Another interesting thing, uh, and there's actually a typo here, FIRO should actually be forecast informed reservoir operations. This is operating the water infrastructure that we do have Acknowledging the fact that we actually have increasingly good weather forecasts in the short term. So, uh, dams historically were operated in a way where you had to assume that your, uh, your, your mega flood could suddenly occur tomorrow without warning. You had to uh, essentially maintain your safety margins accordingly. That, of course, is extremely unlikely. Uh, we're not going to wake up tomorrow. Uh, this is my official weather forecast for tomorrow, not a mega flood. <laughs> um, but believe it or not, that's actually an important piece of information for dam operators because you previously you had to always sort of be in this, this high adrenaline state, and if, if there were the potential to be a large flood tomorrow, you have to maintain lower reservoir levels for safety, right? Now, if you know that that isn't going to happen tomorrow, and almost certainly won't happen three or four days from now, you can start to be a little more conservative with your, with your curves, with releasing water. It also means that if you do think there's a chance something big is coming, you can be more aggressive in promoting safety, right? You can start to flush the system early, and you can be less concerned about losing too much water that you might have otherwise needed during the inevitable drought that followed, because you know you're going to get a big pulse of inflow in the immediate future. Another thing is, is managed on for recharge. We've been hearing a lot about groundwater recently in California, and we've heard about ground subsidence because we've pumped so much water on this off the the ground has literally sunk in some cases by tens of feet over just a couple of decades. Can we reverse that by storing a lot of our water underground? Or more of it, by actively recharging these aquifers, or at least preventing the continued overdraft 
one thing this would do is it would, would, would allow us to have greater safety margins with these dam structures during big floods because we wouldn't feel as compelled to store as much water as possible uh, for the drought to come. It would also mean that you could draw upon that groundwater potentially during drought uh, in a more sustainable way than we currently do, uh, which is just put a bunch of straws in the ground and infinitely extract it until it goes dry. That's the current strategy. Um, which there is legislation that will change that over decades. For a lot of these changes won't go into effect for another decade or two. So uh, we need to be moving more quickly than that. Another thing is that eventually, with the sufficiently extreme flood events, the water is going to do what the water is going to do, uh, which is a slightly longer way of saying the water always wins uh, in the end. And so, in some cases, what we need to be really thinking about is how to improve public awareness of what happens when you do get the big flood events, and that California is susceptible to big flood events. And that's not just a question about climate change, uh, but it's just a quite, it, it's just a matter of fact of the kind of, of Place in the geophysical earth that we that we inhabit. So that's a matter of public awareness, but also things like disaster response exercises, like our storm, and exploring scenarios, the what ifs, the tabletop exercises, uh, the stress testing of various systems. And so just some closing thoughts. Is of course probably no surprise to anyone in this room, but climate change has arrived. This is no longer a prediction regarding the future, but it's an observed reality in the present. Uh, but the nature of that is a reality is sometimes a bit different than folks I think might expect in California. Uh, the warmer California is potentially both drier and wetter uh, than it used to be due to this increasing uh, hydroclimate whiplash effect that we're talking about. Uh, and so this means that we really shouldn't focus too much on mean trends and precipitation because if we do, we might miss the point. This does imply more severe droughts, yes, but perhaps even more so, more severe floods. On the other spectrum. So the question is, how can we come here? Because I don't think it's going to be objective. Uh, I think there's growing recognition of this. But we can't myopically think about scarcity and overabundance of water uh, as these separate problems. We need to be thinking about them as two sides of the same problem. And, you know, really, nature based solutions, as well as engineered solutions, are really uh, screaming out to be used. Uh, at a much larger scale, because they're actually the things that are most commensurate with the physical realities, I think, that are most likely to emerge in this part of the world. And there is, of course, in a broader sense, a great need to deeply integrate. Uh, the, 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 the changes we know uh, are likely to occur in climate, and, and should be clear about what we actually think is, is like that the future could hold, not just the most likely outcomes, but the full range of outcomes, including the extremes, because those are the things we often need to uh, uh, prepare for the most because they produce the greatest societal and ecological impacts. And so from a planning and policy perspective and from a climate adaptation perspective, uh, this is something I think that we need to see a lot more of. Uh, but I'm glad uh, to have conversations with folks that I have here at UC Davis this week and the other meetings I've had this week with very different audiences as well, flood managers, but Nature Conservancy, I think the message is getting through, and it's a different message, I think, than a lot of folks were hearing, uh, even five or ten years ago in California. So I think there is some good news there. And finally, I just wanted to acknowledge kind of the unusual nature of the role that we have across these institutions. I don't want to spend much time on this, uh, because uh, Isabel's introduction explained this nicely. Uh, but it really is only because I, I have this unique arrangement, uh, this trifold from the triple hat learning, I guess I, I sometimes call it, uh, that lets me spend so much time doing both research and then the public facing science communication uh, that I think is, is really important and that I, 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 other folks seem to value a lot as well. So there are relatively few institutions that accommodate this. I'm always looking for ways to, to, to expand the ability of the institution to support these kinds of goals. So um, uh, it's, I think there's, there's a real window for institutions to be leaders in that space. Um, all right, I think with that, uh, I think we'll go a little bit longer than 20 minutes. Uh, hopefully it was worth it, but I still think we've got plenty of time for uh, Q&A discussions. So thank you.